This is A Word, a podcast from Slate. I'm your host, Jason Johnson. The history of the civil rights movement is about courage, commitment, sacrifice, and also love. And one of the great love stories of the era was between Medgar and Merle Evers. And even decades after his assassination, that love story has a lot to tell us now. If you have love, love gives you courage. And that's what I want people to take away. Award-winning journalist Joy Reid talks about her new book, Medgar and Murley, coming up on A Word with me, Jason Johnson. Stay with us. Dreaming of a better sleep? Tossing and turning is not your destiny. And Ollie is here to help. Ollie invites you to sink into sweet, sweet slumber to improve your mental and physical health and overall wellness. More than just melatonin, Ollie's ingredients help you unwind your mind for a delightfully dreamy drift off. Sleep is on the way at Ollie.com. That's O L L Y.com. This episode is brought to you by Visit Williamsburg. In Williamsburg, Virginia, there's never too much of a good thing. Whether you're a foodie, a golfer, a history buff, a shopaholic, an outdoor enthusiast, or a thrill seeker, you'll find what you came for here and more. So ask yourself, what is it you want? Discover Williamsburg and plan your trip at visitwilliamsburg.com. Welcome to A Word, a podcast about race and politics and everything else. I'm your host, Jason Johnson. Look, even before attacking lessons on black history became a political requirement of the American right, the stories of African-American heroes often lacked dimension. The complicated people and their relationships were flattened into paragraph-sized morality tales to be shared and then forgotten during the shortest month of the year. But the true stories of these men and women are filled with nuance, humanity, and yes, love. That's something brought to the forefront of the new book, Medgar and Murley, Medgar Evers, and the love story that awakened America. The best-selling book captures the home and family life of Medgar Evers, the field secretary for the Mississippi NAACP, who was gunned down in front of his own home back in 1963. His widow, Murley Evers Williams, became an activist in her own right fighting for justice in his murder, eventually leading the NAACP and rising as a key voice in keeping the movement alive for younger generations. But this book goes beyond the history and the heroism to explore the romance between Megger and Murley and how that love endured long after his death. Joining us to talk about it is author Joy Ann Reed. She's a veteran political analyst and the host of MSNBC's The Readout. And my dear friend, Joy Reed, welcome to A Word. Thank you, Dr. Jason. It's always good to be here with you. Tell us a little bit about why you centered and framed this book around a love story. I picked doing it as a love story because obviously Medgar Evers, you know, he's been gone for 60 years. And the person that I was able to access and actually access the mind and heart of is Merle Evers Williams who I met when we were doing a show from LA and I had interviewed her before, you know, remotely. Uh, But this was my chance to, like, interview her in person on my weekend show on AM Joy. And she exudes love story. Like, she's a civil rights icon, right, clearly. And that's why we had her on the show. But what she gives you when you actually talk to her, she gives you love story. Because she is a thousand percent still madly in love with Megha Wiley Evers, like, to this day. And when you just engage her for a few minutes about him, she doesn't talk about his heroic stand for civil rights or the hard work he was doing out in the Mississippi Delta. She talks about how much she was in love with that man. And that's what stays with you when you talk to her. And so when I thought about the next thing I wanted to write about after doing the Trump book, that's what had stayed with me. And I had never read a civil rights love story. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to write a civil rights love story. For the younger, for the uninitiated, Tell us a little bit about Medgar Evers. I I found his military background, the fact that he was a rabble rouser, even when he was a kid, him and his brother were fascinating. Tell us a little bit about him. So Medgar Evers, he was a World War II veteran. He actually fought on Omaha Beach. If you saw Saving Private Ryan, there were no black people in the movie, but there were black people on the beach when he was one of them. People who may have heard of the Red Ball Express. These were the black men who were tasked with transportation. So they had to get 
the guns and the ammo to the front line and back. And they had to make it to the front line alive to do that and make it back from the front line alive to do that. So they were a part of the World War II fundamental mission, even though they were written out of the history largely. And he signed up on the brink of his 18th birthday because he revered his big brother, Charles. And Charles Evers was a whole character. He was a wild kid. And they were these young Black Mississippi men raised in the 1940s, but raised in just a different kind of family. Their father used to be called Crazy Jim because he was the rare Black man who didn't bow and scrape before white people. And so white people thought, well, if he doesn't bow and scrape before us, he must be crazy. So they called him Crazy Jim. And their mom was this church lady who, you know, more than anything, wanted her children to go to school. And they basically had books in the home all the time. And they wanted them to read about Black people in a positive way and not in a negative way. So they raised their children to be readers, to be kind of nerds, but to be manly men. And so these two brothers go off to war. And when they come home, Medgar is like, and Charles are like, we fought in the war. We sacrificed for our country. We have a right to vote. We have a right to be treated as men here. And so that was the start of their fight for civil rights. It was very basic. It was very personal. We're going to vote whether these white men want us to or not. And our families are going to live with dignity, whether these white people like it or not. And that is what started his activism. Murley is sort of a different story. What was her upbringing like? What was her background compared to this sort of rough and tumble guy that she eventually falls for? The thing is that her grandmother and mom raised her. You know, her grandmother was this interesting character. She called her mama because her grandmother marched across the street when she was born and took her from her mom, who was a 16-year-old teen mother, who, you know, at the time that was a kind of shameful condition. But she felt that she could raise her in a way that she deserved. And she didn't want her to be a bastard child. She wanted her to have, you know, proper upbringing. And the mom was in Merley's life, but she called her Madeer. So she wounds up being raised by her grandmother and her aunt, who's also named Merley. So they called Merley little sister. And these women were educators. And so they were in an upper echelon of Black society as teachers. But that didn't mean they had any money. Right. But they raised their little sister, they called her. They raised Miss Murley to have this dignity and to actually have high expectations of herself. Like they were the family that had like a nice front lawn. So that was like the thing on that block. So they were like the the queens of the block because they had a beautiful front lawn and they didn't have indoor plumbing. So this was the level of dignity. They said, we may not have indoor plumbing, but look at this lawn. We keep ourselves with a certain level of dignity. They had a piano in their home. And uh, not only was Merle, the elder Merle, a piano teacher, she was Merle's piano teacher. They also sent her with an external out-of-the-house piano teacher. So they told her, you are so good and so brilliant as a piano player, you could one day play Carnegie Hall. Those are the level of dreams they wanted to give their little black girl. And she performed Merle in this little singing group called the Chansonettes, who were like locally popular. So these two are very different. Medgar is from this feisty black family that was trying to defy the conventions of the South. Merle's family didn't defy the conventions of the South. They understood racism was there, but they were trying to raise their child with a dignity within the conventions of the South. I want to talk a little bit about their courtship. I mean, their age gap, their life experience gaps, but I mean, they quickly fell in love and decided they were going to make a life together like much faster than anyone in modern times sort of thinks about these things. Right. I mean, also, that's like a 1950s thing as well. In that era, you know, marriage happened like a lot faster. But say basically what happens is Medgar comes home. He's 25 years old. And of course, college is delayed. He actually dropped out of high school. He he left high school in his senior year in order to enlist in the army. So when he comes back, he does this program to finish his high school degree. And then he applies to Alcorn State College. It was Alcorn College at the time. And so he goes in at 25 because that's what happens when you fight in the war for a couple of years, come home, finish high school and then go to college. So he also is a really good football player. So he joins a football team. He's a halfback and like a really talented one. So he's out there and all the football players on the first day of school are kind of checking out the girls because it's, you know, day one. And they're checking out the freshmen who are coming in. And she's one of the pretty freshmen. And so, yeah, he comes up to her. You know, you shouldn't lean on that flat pole. You're going to get electrocuted. She's 17. You know, like knows nothing about the world. The boys she's used to in high school are, hey, baby, baby boys. You know, she doesn't even know what to deal (laughs) with with this man who is everything her grandma and her auntie told her to stay away from. A World War II veteran, an upperclassman and a football player. 
So he's all the things they they said don't don't mess with any of that, and he's all of that. And so she's intrigued by him in a way because of the danger of that, but also because he just knows so much about the world. She's used to boys who had never left their little town in Mississippi, let alone ever left the country. Most white people had never left the country, had never been outside the United States. So this man had been to the world. He had been to Belgium and to France. He had fought in a war. He was obsessed with the liberation movements on the African continent, especially in Kenya. So he could talk to her about Jomo Kenyatta's movement and the Mau Mau, stuff she had never heard of. And so it kind of made her want to be better. So she's up there like trying to learn and jump in the encyclopedias and figure out things and get newspapers so she could be up to the task of just talking to this guy because she wanted her brain to be, you know, respected. She wanted him to respect her as a human being, as a as a as an intelligent person. So they're having these conversations where he's like, 17 to get you 20. I'm not gonna date this girl. She's right. too young. <laughs> but he liked her, but he didn't want to let on that he liked her, liked her, because she's only 17. So their courtship is like an intellectual romance, which I love, right? They have this sort of intellectual romance that doesn't flip to a romance until she's 18. But all this time, not only is he like entrancing her with, you know, doing things like pretending he likes classical music so he can listen to her play the piano, even though he's like, I ain't trying to listen to that. But he's like, I'm gonna pretend I like it because I like her. But he's also like courting her parents. So he like will go up to Vicksburg like, hey, grandma, (laughs) you know, and auntie, I'm a good guy. And he like charms the family. So by the time they, you know, want to be married, the family agrees because they actually they kind of like him, too. We're going to take a short break and we come back. Joy Reid shares more about her book, Medgar and Murley. Medgar Evers and the love story that awakened America. This is A Word with Jason Johnson. Stay tuned. The next generation of influential Black voices can be found on NPR's new collection, Black Stories, Black Truths. Black Stories, Black Truths is a celebration of Blackness from NPR. Each of NPR's Black voices are as distinct, varied, and nuanced as the Black experience itself. In the Black Stories, Black Truths collection, you'll hear stories of joy, resilience, empowerment, and creating world-shifting things out of struggle. Every episode is a living account about what it means to be Black today, told from a unique Black perspective. From Bobby Shmurda to The Wire, Michelle Obama to Reparations, there's no limit to the range of Black Stories, Black Truths. Black perspectives haven't always been centered in the telling of America's story. Now, they are the story. Hear a feed of episodes from across NPR's podcasts that center Black voices. It's NPR Noir. Turn on NPR today and hear a range of voices as varied, nuanced, and Black as the country they reflect. Listen now to Black Stories, Black Truths from NPR, wherever you get podcasts. Shipping can make or break a sale, so optimize how you ship your orders with ShipStation. They make it easy to automate and manage orders no matter how big your business grows. And they might even be able to help reduce shipping and warehouse costs. So optimize and keep up your momentum for growth with ShipStation. Sign up for your free 60-day trial now at ShipStation.com and use the code P-O-D. That's ShipStation.com with the code P-O-D. You're listening to A Word with Jason Johnson. Today, we're talking with MSNBC's Joy Reid about her best-selling book, Medgar M. Murley, Medgar Evers, and the love story that awakened America. So this, this is interesting because, you know, one of the things that we sort of learn about the civil rights movement is you have some people who were sort of born into the movement. You have some people who are kind of married into the movement. You have some people who are kind of martyred into the movement. And I feel like Murley married into it. What was the discussion like, right? Because you have this firebrand Medgar who's like, yo, we got to stay here in Mississippi. We got to fight. And Merle's like, we could have gone to Chicago. You know, <laughs> what What happened in their marriage, right, that said, hey, we're going to dedicate our lives to living in the American apartheid state of the Mississippi South, and we're going to stay here and fight. What yeah. What did that conversation sound like? And in a life and death situation, how did she take it? It was a tough conversation, you know, and the thing about Miss Murley is she's very open in our conversations about how much she resisted the idea of being a part of the movement. And at times that made her feel a bit embarrassed that she wasn't up for it. She was just in love with this man and she just wanted her man. And she was a 1950s housewife 
And that's what she wanted to be. That was her aspiration, as was a lot of women at the time. So she wasn't unusual. And she was also terrified because she knew being a native Mississippian whose family went all the way back to enslavement, as did Medgar's, that it would likely mean his death because he was so high profile. So basically what happens is Medgar catches the attention of a guy called T.R.M. Howard, who everyone should really know more about. He had made a, a fortune and he also had things like a clinic, the first clinic that actually offered an HMO to help people afford health. Healthcare. He was in this town called Mount Bayou, which was way out in the Mississippi Delta, which Merle hated. But he hired Medgar to sell insurance. He had an insurance company called Magnolia Insurance. So Medgar takes this job and Merle's like, OK, he has a good, decent job. He's going to be an insurance salesman. But what she didn't know was that he's also going to be selling liberation. So when he's going out into the Delta, dressed often as a field hand himself so he could talk to these people, they would relate to him. He would say to them, you know what? You have more rights than you think. I'm telling you, you have the right to vote. You have the right to dignity. You should join the NAACP. You should register yourself to vote. Let me tell you why. And so he's actually selling them on liberation, which is very dangerous to do. He and his colleagues are pushing people to boycott gas stations that won't let them go inside and use the restroom. They're like, if you can't use the restroom inside, why are you giving them your money? So they institute this boycott in the Delta and push people to actually patronize a Black-owned gas station where they could be treated with respect. And so those are the kind of things he's doing. She is terrified about all this because he spends a lot of his job on the road. He's not home, and she never knows if he's coming home. So finally, he decides he wants to be Thurgood Marshall and wants to apply to law school at Ole Miss and integrate Ole Miss. Now she's really scared. She's like, if you do that, they're going to kill you. This isn't a thing you should do. But the NAACP has noticed his work and says, we have a better idea. They actually fly him to New York and they offer him this new job they're creating, field secretary for the Mississippi NAACP. So he'll be their statewide field secretary and investigate the murders of black people and also try to register black people to vote and try to get more blacks to join the NAACP. That's his job, investigations, memberships, and also registration of voters. And that actually is a relief to Murley because they get to move to Jackson, this bigger city. But it mm-hmm. makes it worse. <laughs> it makes it more right, high right. profile. He becomes number one on the Klan's kill list. And so their conversations were tough. She often asks him, do you love me and your kids more or this work? And he tries to tell her, I love you. And I'm doing this because of you. I'm doing this to make the state good enough for you and good enough for our kids. I want to talk a little bit about Medgar Evers' death. I, quite frankly, was struck by the idea that he had been asking for extra security from the NAACP and they were like, yeah, we can't get it to you. And then he ends up dead. Talk a little bit about his death and how that transformed Murley. I mean, any time there is a death of a spouse, it's going to do things to you. It's going to affect your life. But she basically had a a movement dropped in her lap. When her husband is assassinated right in front of their own home, she's the witness She sees him die with her baby standing next to her, nine, eight, and three years old. She's the only one who knows the pain he went through leading up to it when, as you said, his own bosses were rebuking him for doing movement work rather than praising him. He struggled. I remember sitting in the Library of Congress reading the letters, the desperate telegrams and letters he's writing to his bosses in New York saying, I'm broke. I'm not making enough money to afford to keep my car up. And if my car breaks down in the road, I'm going to get killed by the Klan. I need more Um, you know, money for gas. I need more money for repairs of my car. My car is my only lifeline. You guys are getting on me about not registering enough people to vote. They're terrified. These people are terrorized. They don't, they don't lack civic responsibility. They're scared. My numbers, yeah, they're low. They're not joining the NAACP, not because they don't have civic mindsets or don't care about civil rights. They're scared and they're too scared. And so he's writing back and forth and being rebuked by them. And then when his fellow NAACP members say, can you get him some full time security? He's getting death threats. They're like, we don't have we, we have better things to do with our money. That's literally yeah. what they said to him. Yeah, I- and so she's the old, she's the person hearing all this. And she's the person in whose lap he's laying as he's crying it out at home. She's the one where he's saying, I can't fight the Klan and fight you. You know, so th- all of this is what she knows. And so when he's killed. She opens her front door and there's Dan Rather and a whole TV news crew. She's the first civil rights widow to have to deal with that because Malcolm X doesn't get killed for two more years and King doesn't get killed for five more years. And she has no playbook. There's no one to teach her what to do. She has to call on her Vicksburg 
reading, how she's raised by her family, what they taught her about presentation, what she learned as a girl in a singing group, how to present herself. She's like little Beyonce that's in the group, right? And has to learn, like, how do I, in my little Beyonce group is all I have to go on. You know, the fact that I used to play in the, the mass meetings. I was the person who played the piano with Medgar. I was his secretary. I know him. And so she has to translate him to the world while also looking pretty, not being angry, not crying too much or too little, her kids looking perfect, her kids never being naughty. Everything had to be perfect. And she had to teach the rest of the world and the other civil rights widows how to do that. She was the first. How has Merle ever sort of inverted or changed what our expectations are of sort of a a civil rights widow? What has she done that sort of eked out her own path besides being the first but what has she done to say, hey, you know what, I'm me and this is how I'm going to do it, regardless of what the expectations are? What Merle did, which is revolutionary because none of the other widows did this specific thing. She became an NAACP leader. In fact, it's ultimate leader. It's national board chair president. So she climbed the rungs to the very top of the organization that in many ways failed her husband. So she had to overcome her ambivalence about the NAACP. Number two. The big six who spoke at the March on Washington were all men. And there was a deep misogyny to the movement, which we don't often like to deal with in the community, but it was there. Coretta Scott King wrote a lot about that in her memoir, which I read uh, in doing the research for this book. And she talked about how outrageous it was for her and other Black women that the women were pushed to the side. The only woman invited to speak on the dais as one of the big six was Merle Evers Williams. Because Dr. King had a deep love for Medgar and they were in conversation throughout the whole of the movement and of Medgar's life. He was in conversation, not his life, but his life in the movement. He was in conversation with King because he was trying to build a Kingian movement in Jackson. King was his template that he was trying to copy and that's what was making his bosses mad. So King speaks about Medgar when he gives his first version of his I Have a Dream speech. He says, I have a dream that people like Medgar Evers and Emmett Till can live to adulthood with dignity. But he takes that out of the March on Washington speech because they're trying to mollify the white people. (laughs) Basically, make it more, calm it down. But she, more than any other civil rights widow, becomes a movement leader and takes on the movement and takes control of the NAACP, fixes its finances and its reputation. There isn't another civil rights widow who did that. And she also maintains an optimism, but also a forceful optimism about change that continues to this day. And that lady is 90 going on 91 and is just as passionate today about changing this country for the better. We're going to take a short break and we come back more with Joy Reid about her new best-selling book, Medgar and Murley. This is A Word with Jason Johnson. Stay tuned. Making everyone happy on vacation isn't easy, but you know what is? Going to Aruba. All you have to do is walk out your door to find pristine pools, relaxing white sand beaches, and an island teeming with outdoor activities that'll put a smile on any face. You won't just feel great, you'll all feel great, filled with a calmer, more peaceful vibe that radiates Aruba's warmth. And the best part is, it never fades. That's the Aruba effect. Plan your family trip at aruba.com. Without the ones like you, who work tirelessly to keep things running, everything would suddenly stop. Hospitals, factories, schools, and power plants, they all depend on you. No matter the weather, emergency, or time of day, you're the ones who get it done. At Granger, we're here for you with professional grade industrial supplies. Count on real time product availability and fast delivery. Call clickgranger.com or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done. You're listening to A Word with Jason Johnson. Today we're talking with MSNBC host Joy Reid about her best selling book, Medgar and Murley Medgar Evers and the Love Story That Awakened America. What's it been like releasing a book like this? at a time where there is a concerted, naked, non-subtle effort to completely erase this kind of history, despite the fact that these people are still alive. It felt like an important thing to do in this era. I feel like the answer to attempts to erase history is to put out more history and to give more information. It's one of the reasons I'm vehemently against banning TikTok. I learn so much history just from the young historians who are using 
TikTok as a platform to teach about history in these amazing like, little four minute clips. You know, we need a reckoning in this country with our history, not to make black people feel better, but to make white Americans more realistic about the ways in which their democracy is failing. You can't understand why this democracy is teetering on the brink of collapse if you don't understand history. And I don't mean black history. I mean, white history, which involves in many cases the subjugation of black people. And it's it's sort of unfortunate that we categorize things like what I've written as black history, but it's also the history of white America. And it's the history of the things that they've allowed. It was perfectly legal to kill black people up until like maybe the 1980s, 70s. When did white men ever get convicted of killing a black person before that? It was very rare. And you could just do it knowing that there would be an all white male jury uh, until 1968 in the South and much of the South, even white women couldn't serve on juries. And you'd know you'd be acquitted in five minutes. That's the reason Byron Della Beckwith felt free to brag about killing Medgar Evers, because he knew he would never be convicted. And he wasn't convicted until the 1990s when you had a mixed race jury that was able to hear his case. The denial of rights to black people has been part and parcel to the denial of democracy flourishing in this country. And if you don't want to know that, then you can't keep asking, why are we failing as a democracy? That's why we're failing. What's the one thing you want people to be left with when they close this book and they're like, wow? The takeaway I want people to get from this book is that it is regular, ordinary people who did the heroic work of the civil rights movement. They weren't superheroes. They were just regular people like you and me. And they simply had the courage of their convictions and their convictions were not heroic convictions. They were regular convictions. My kids should be able to go to the library. My kids should be able to go to school. My kids should be able to go to the zoo. They should be able to go see a movie because they're Americans. And I shouldn't have had to maybe potentially die, you know, (laughs) in Normandy in order to have these rights. But I actually did. And therefore, my wife and kids deserve to live where they live and not have to leave and get on a train to Chicago to have rights. They should be able to have rights here, where they are from, where their family built this state in the era of slavery. And therefore, we don't want something special. We want what you have, which is basic human dignity. And it was ordinary people who said that. It was ordinary kids, young people, teenagers for the most part, who had the courage to say that. And they were absolutely right then, and they're absolutely right now. And, and the last thing I'll say is that the reason it's a love story is not just the love between these two people, but it's the love of your block. It's the love of your kids. It's the love of your girlfriend group, which Miss Murley had with Coretta Scott King and with Dr. Betty Shabazz. It's the love of your country, but it's also the love of your basic humanity. And if you have love, love gives you courage. And that's what I want people to take away. Joanne Reed is the host of MSNBC's The Readout and the author of the best-selling Medgar and Murley, Medgar Evers, and the love story that awakened America. My friend, thank you so much for making this book, and thank you so much for joining me today on A Word. Thank you, my friend. I appreciate you, Jason. Thank you. That's a word for this week. The show's email is a word at slate.com. This episode was produced by Ayana Angel. Ben Richmond is Slate's Senior Director of Podcast Operations. Alicia Montgomery is the Vice President of Slate Audio. Our theme music was produced by Don Will. I'm Jason Johnson. Tune in next week for Word. Join us today during the Jeep Celebration event. Right now, get 20% below MSRP for an average of 15178 under MSRP on the purchase of a 2023 Jeep Grand Cherokee Overland 4xe or Summit 4xe. Not compatible with lease offers or with any other consumer incentive set of offers. 15178 average based on 20% below average MSRP from all 2023 Grand Cherokee Overland 4xe and Summit 4xe models in dealer stock. Residency restrictions apply. Take retail delivery from dealer stock by 4-1. Jeep is a registered trademark.